Um, hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Vandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, Be Waste Wise is a non-profit organization which addresses the need for knowledge dissemination and waste management. Be Waste Wise started with the belief that consistent education leads to long-term change. And uh, we strongly believe that everybody working in waste, no matter where they are, deserve access to latest thinking and case studies and the amount of knowledge that is existence in this, existent in this space all over the world. And uh, currently, I think it's a fairly, I think, I, I mean, it's bleak times with the pandemic that's, uh, that's with the COVID pandemic. And uh, while the public health systems are responding to it with utmost urgency, uh, waste and sanitation, which is an essential service, uh, also needs to respond. And, and uh, owing, to the, uh, owing to the current state of things, we wanted to put together a panel to try and understand how exactly are our waste management systems coping in these times. And we're very happy, uh, we're thankful to all the panelists for agreeing to put this together so quickly. Thanks a lot, Sarajane, for putting the panel together so quickly. And this is not going to be the last panel in the space. While today we will exclusively talk about what's happening in the UK, we are working to put together panels where we talk about waste system responses all over the world. And uh, yeah, before I just hand this over to Sarajing, let me just give a quick introduction of all three panelists. We have Sarajing Vidalson, who's a chartered waste manager based in UK. She is the moderator for today's panel. We have Yar Nostet who is a waste and recycling manager of Westminster City Council. And there's Karen Aguilera, who is the environmental sustainability officer at Northwest Ambulance Service NHS Trust. Uh, I request all the attendees to please share your questions via the Q&A section. Uh, we will, the panelists will ensure that all your questions are answered before the panel gets over. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Over to you, Sarajan. Lovely, Shweta. Thank you very much. And I, I don't think really I could introduce this panel better myself, to be honest. Um, you set the scene perfectly because waste management really is an essential service and we're having to rise to the challenges that we're currently facing. Waste is a considerable byproduct of necessary infection control measures, but we're also seeing huge behavioural change impacts within businesses and at home, which are affecting the, the quantities and um, the composition of waste that's arising. As waste management professionals, we're really having to think about actually going back to basics and the original purpose of waste collection, which is actually to, to protect health. So the panel that we've put together, and thank you very much, Karen and Yano, for, for agreeing to join in such busy times. I know you're both really, really busy with operational um, issues at the moment. What we really wanted to do was actually talk about what guidance has come out, share our own personal experiences, what's going on at the moment, try and do a little bit of predicting in terms of what will happen over the next sort of three months, and then think about potential longer term impacts of that as well. At the end of the webinar, um, we'll also do some signposting to some relevant um, sources for the UK, and we'll make sure that that's set, excuse me, sent out to people afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over first to Karen and then to Jarno, who's going to uh, introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their day-to-day -day role, and also give us um, some insight into actually what's happening within their services at the moment, what are the pressures that, that they're seeing on the ground? Thank you. So over to Karen first. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Um, so I'm Karen, uh, Environmental Sustainability Officer at the Northwest Ambulance Service NHS Trust. Um, my day to day work uh, involves quite a range of things, um, but around waste in particular, it is compliance, segregation, staff education and engagement. Um, the compliance part of it is, is all around duty of care, so I'm out auditing healthcare waste facilities, making sure that they are compliant with their environmental permits, um, and uh, yeah, uh, making sure our staff are aware of their responsibilities in relation to segregation of infectious from non-infectious waste. Um, in terms of what we're seeing at the moment across, I think, the whole NHS uh, is really volume, 
um, it's, it's an increase in the amount of infectious waste that is being produced um, and some disruption to service as well. So the collection of that waste. Um, and I can only perceive that not improving in the near future, um, I would say. Um, but yeah, definitely volume is going to be a big problem for us. Mm -hmm. And it, when you say disruption to service, is that because uh, the staff members themselves are isolating or, or becoming ill? Um, it's because, um, that's a really good question actually. So in terms of disruption to service, disruption to waste collection services. Yeah. Um, so I would imagine that some of that is down to uh, staff illness and some of that is just down to the sheer volume of waste that needs to be collected. So you will find that contingency yeah. plans will, um, will prioritise where there is larger volumes of waste mm -hmm. over smaller volumes. Um, and that makes sense. Um, I see no reason why they shouldn't do that. Uh, but eventually it becomes a point where the smaller volumes are the larger volumes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, I think part of it is because they are low on staff. Uh, potentially due to illness or having to self-isolate for 12 weeks um, and part of it is just because they're having to focus their efforts where the volume of waste is. And in terms of the volume of waste you're describing I'm assuming that this is additional um, PPE sort of um, waste materials as well as um, you know anything connected with actually dealing with patients. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Mm. So um, if you imagine on the back of an ambulance, we have two bins. Yep. They are uh, very small, about 10 litres each. So if we attend a patient who is suspected of contracting the virus, then the member of staff will have to don PPE from head to foot. Yep. Um, and that one, item, that one set of PPE can then actually fill the bin. Mm. Whereas previously, when they were attending patients, they would they would ha be able to manage with that 10 litre container for perhaps uh, half of a shift. So about six hours before they needed to empty. But um, yes, it, it would definitely be down to PPE more than anything else, because there is um, obviously quite a, a strong requirement to wear it. Um, and it's not just a case of putting on a mask. There are layers of PPE that need to be worn. Yeah, yes. Oh, amazing. I did read, uh, so the Waste Industry Safety and Health Forum uh, released some draft guidance recently. One of the figures in it that shocked me was that um, probably large organisations should prepare for around 20% of their workforce being unable to, to work during this period. And the figures range between sort of 15 and 30%. But across the waste industry, so just those people sort of uh, collecting, treating, processing waste. There's over 107,000 people working in our industry. So, you know, if you're looking at the top range of those figures, that's over 30,000 people potentially being off. Now, they're estimating less than that, but the scale of the people that could actually be, be off is, is phenomenal, really. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Um, Jana, I'm going to hand over to you now. If you could do the same, so give us a little introduction and then tell us what's happening in Westminster at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I think it's probably more interesting to talk about the local authority landscape in general rather than just, you know, my small patch in, in central London, um, which, which is quite different than, than other local authorities in the UK. Um, so I'm the Waste and Recycling Manager for Westminster City Council. Um, on a daily basis, we look after the uh, provision of waste management services, uh, ranging from collection to disposal of various streams, service development, um, um, performance, um, also specifying new services, um, adjusting services where needed. Um, and through my line of work, I'm the secretary of the National Association of Waste Disposal Officers. So that's a specific professional organization for those local authorities with responsibilities for waste disposal. Uh, waste disposal as in anything from composting to recycling sorting, recycling treatment, energy from waste, uh, as well as landfill, transfer and haulage. Um, and what you can see at the moment, that, that there's a very varied picture across the UK. Um, and, you know, the, the, there's no 
um, you know, there's the sort of no set scenario what's happening and some authorities are are greatly affected at the moment through uh, the absence of staff um that not necessarily that they're ill but they're in they're in self-isolation because they might have been abroad or they might have been in contact with someone that's that's got the um the coronavirus and that's impacting on staff levels um what we do um, stress is that you know for a local authority the most important thing to do at the moment is maintaining public hygiene uh, and that means waste is collected and that might mean that sometimes local authorities need to make decisions on okay what, what's important here are we going to collect bulky waste or are we going to keep the, the general waste service running and those decisions need to be made on the local level because all circumstances in local authorities are different so um, there's guidance that's come out from the WISH Forum uh, that's very helpful in establishing sort of where priorities need to be. But I think for local authorities, they need to refer to their business continuity plan and which services mm -hmm. need to run and what, need, what measures need to be taken in order to ensure those services run. Excellent. So in terms of business continuity, uh, I think we're already seeing some local authorities starting to these collections of garden waste and food and garden waste in particular. And you've mentioned bulky waste as well. How widespread do you think that is at the moment? Um, it, it really varies. And, you know, if I look within London, there are some authorities that are still running pretty much full service, including my own. Um, staff levels have, uh, you know, reductions have been quite minimal. Um, there are some other boroughs where it's, where it's quite severe and they had to, you know, curtail pretty much all service provision down to a minimal recycling service and a, and a general waste service. So mm -hmm. the, the, the picture that's sort of developing is, is very varied. Um, some authorities elsewhere in the UK had to suspend services and others are running near to normal. And, you know, the, what, moving forward, I think it's, you know, where can we help each other and what, what can be done to make sure that those authorities that are suffering um, can still provide services, provide a service which is really essential considering we're in, in, a, in a public health emergency at the moment. Yes. And are you seeing in terms of um, ensuring delivery of those core operations, a lot of local authorities have a sort of a core base of staff that do street cleansing and waste collections. Are you seeing street cleansing services dialing down at the moment to support on collections or? It's, you shouldn't forget as well that the demand for street cleansing in a lot of areas will reduce because there's less footfall, there's less people yeah. out, um, there's less people eating their lunch in parks or, you know, on, on benches, etc. Um, yeah. There's, there's less street let litter to contend with. So, you know, if, if that means that you've got you know, slack in a certain service, you use that resource to you know provide another service so you might use some street sweepers as loaders on on a waste collection service or you know you need to be flexible in where you deploy your staff um demand in certain services has gone down um you know collection of waste from businesses street cleansing um certain other types of services and that might mean that they get redeployed on other services and you know don't forget that local authorities will have a huge range of staff working for them and for example park staff is a good example right. um you know there will be reduced demand for those services can they be used elsewhere and the same uh, you know accounts for um um social services so delivering meals on wheels or servicing to uh, vulnerable residents etc where where have you got your resource demands and where have you got your surpluses and can you redeploy those within the organization mm -hmm. you mentioned um businesses there as well and i, I know westminster you have a, a very large um business portfolio in terms of your commercial waste arising what sort of changes are you seeing there some are going down and some are going up. So, uh -huh. you know, all the businesses that are closed at the moment, you know, we, we, the, the, most of the retail businesses, um, a lot of the offices have got reduced operations. Don't forget, there's still people going into work. There's still offices uh -huh. operating in certain areas. They still produce waste. Um, there is also an increased demand from certain business sectors, such as healthcare, as well uh -huh. as food, food supply, whether that's you know, uh, delivery meals or takeaway food or supermarkets or off licenses, they are, you know, trading, you know, they're seeing increased trade, sort of seeing increased waste generation levels. But on, on, on the whole, most of the economy is shut down at the moment. So, you know, there's no one shopping on, 
on the major shopping streets at the moment. So there will be, you know, there's, there's the waste demand there is sort of dried up. But, you know, we can see, for example, from the hospitals that we work with, that there's a lot of extra waste coming out at the moment because they've yeah. geared up to, you know, maximum operation levels. Mm. We've just actually had um, uh, a Q&A or a comment come in uh, from Paul Morgan, thank you, who says that across Greater Manchester, a couple of authorities have moved to a residual only service. Um, so I think it, that's quite a dramatic shift already, isn't it really? Um, cutting it down to those uh, core services. Is this something we're going to see more of, do you think? Just focusing on um, one residual collection for local authorities? one thing is the authorities resourcing level but once you've mm. picked up the waste it needs to go somewhere as well um mm -hmm. and most cycling operations are quite labor intensive picking lines um yeah. members of staff uh, operating various bits of the plant when those resource levels are affected then there might be no other option but to reduce plant throughput, which means that you can bring less waste there. Or, you know, in the worst case, it might mean that they've shut down. And for example, you can see that in Paris, where they've shut down all the city's MRFs. So there's a general waste only service there because they simply don't have the staff or don't want to, you know, get staff to work in an, in an operation that, that where they can't maintain, I don't know, hygiene or health and safety, whatever the reasons are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that's going to, you know, th th that might start developing in the UK as well. And the other major thing is, is that, you know, out of most treatment processes, there's a form of residues and in recycling sorting, for example, that the materials need to go onto the recyclers. If there's a lack of haulage, or a lack of demand for materials. And it means that those materials are gonna build up um, and um, basically they, um, they will stop functioning at some point if there's no storage space or no outlets for those materials. Yeah. It's a how, that will, how that will develop is to be seen over, over the next, over the next um, couple of months and uh, you know, a couple of weeks. And, and you know, not all facilities are the same and some facilities are more sensitive to this sort of disruption than others. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a few things you picked up there. One was around sort of social or physical distancing um, and acknowledging that actually a lot of our operations for treatment and disposal require people to be fairly close together. And the other element that's quite interesting is the knock on supply chain. So often we forget about, as you said, the logistics elements, you know, once waste is collected, where does it go to? Once it's treated, then where does it go to? But also mm -hmm. end markets as well, actually. One um, article I was reading over the weekend talked about um, metals and that a lot of, well, some of the um, smelters on mainland Europe had shut because actually their customers were the automotive sector and that has you know seen a huge decline in output doesn't need the raw material so there's a stop on on that there as well um, just before I move to Karen there's one other element in terms of sort of the collection disposal that I wanted to pick up on with you Yana which was around HWRCs or RRCs reuse and recycling centres um, again I think this is an area where there's been differing practice across the UK some um, HWRCs have shut completely, others are operating um, a, a reduced service. What have you seen from around uh, London and from your NAUDO um, colleagues? Most of the HWRCs in the UK are closed and there are a handful of, of ones that are still open. Um, in, in London, as of last week, we had two sites that were still open, but they've closed now as well. Um, it's, it's, if you look at sort of what HWRCs HWRCs take in it, it, it's mm. mainly waste from you know DIY activities clear out bulky yeah. goods a lot of garden waste um, is it really necessary to present that waste for disposal now or can mm. it wait until later bearing in mind that there's a lot of pressures on the system already and do we then you know when we have loads of people sitting at home do we want to open the floodgates to enormous amounts of garden waste and cardboard mm -hmm. and all, everything else to flood the system them, it has to be handled as well so it's it's you know it's not just the social distancing on sites and all the you know the surfaces that are being touched that need to be disinfected like the hand rails
sales and, and, and everything else, mm -hmm. but where's the material going to go? And when, you, when you're dealing with a shortage of drivers, for example, who's going to take those big containers from the HWRCs to the disposal site? So that's mm -hmm. also something that needs to be considered. And you can see that across the UK, the last weekend before the shutdown, and a huge number of people were, were, were utilizing the HWRCs and it was clear out, garden waste, all sorts of materials that, you know, are generated because people have got a lot of time on their hands, so they're going to keep busy. And, mm -hmm. you know, shutting them, at least for the time being, will bring some, you know, some breathing space to the industry. And, for example, drivers that you might have ferrying containers from your HWRCs to the disposal site might be used somewhere else where there's more of an urgent need to make sure that waste doesn't start accumulating outside people's houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge behavioural element in there as well, and I think that is an area that I'd like to explore how the public have been behaving. But before we get on to that, I wanted to come back to you, Karen, just to talk about the, the NHS in general. Obviously, you work for the Ambulance Trust, don't you, up in the, the yeah. northwest? So you're picking up some of the most um, critical patients and delivering them to the trust as well. Um, I've how are the the trusts and the sites themselves doing in terms of waste management? So I think we are still in quite early days at the mm -hmm. moment. So a lot of larger acute trusts will have on-site transfer stations. Yeah. Um, so they will have some ability to store large volumes of waste. Um, bigger challenges probably come from your community health care trusts um, and your ambulance services um, or I suppose any trust with a large estate full of small buildings, maybe mental health trusts, that kind of thing, uh, where they don't have the capacity to store a large volume of waste. Um, and that can be quite problematic um, in trying to manage that. Uh, and really, I suppose we are very dependent on the guys who come and collect this waste. Mm -hmm. So we're very dependent on the capacity in the UK to process this waste, to be able to collect it. Um, you know, they also rely on, um, on drivers. So mm -hmm. we don't have drivers and a driver's mate, which is quite difficult again to maintain social distancing. Um, then those collections won't go ahead. Uh, and, and contingency plans will, if they haven't already, start to be enacted. Um, so uh, there will be some movements to clear additional space so mm -hmm. that they can store larger volumes. Um, if, like ourselves, you have a transport team that are suitably trained and the vehicles are suitable, suitably adapted to move healthcare waste, then you will start doing this yourselves and delivering it into transfer stations provided mm -hmm. that they have the capacity um and really it's it's almost like a, a i don't know how to word it it's almost like a game so it's it's moving the waste to wherever it can go um mm -hmm. because sometimes it's not the most sensible approach to leave it where it is um you know you have to understand that from our perspective, some of our ambulance stations are, are as big as a porter cabin. Um, so storing waste can be quite difficult. The bins cannot be kept inside, which means once the bin is full, you've got nowhere secure to store that waste. Mm -hmm. So it's about ensuring that if the bins are full, that excess waste is moved to somewhere where it can be safely secured and doesn't present a risk to the public um, or to the staff's health either. So um, it really is about being sensible, moving the waste to where we know there is space at the moment um, and keeping the dialogue open with, with the healthcare waste industry um, mm -hmm. on their ability to collect and process this waste. Um, because it, you know, as I said before, it's only gonna get harder. Um, this is not gonna get easier for us um, and the volumes are gonna increase. So yeah at the moment it's about being logical it's about doing what we can do to reduce mm -hmm. the risk um and if if that means storing it in a suitable container on an ambulance station in a garage that is locked and and the only people that have access is staff then that is what we will do if that means that moving it somewhere else because we don't have that facility to store that waste securely to prevent any risk to public health um then we will have to do that um mm -hmm. but yes it is very much 
keeping in contact not just with those who collect the waste but other NHS trusts and where they are at as well because you will find that some are dedicated coronavirus centres and yeah. others will just be doing routine um, routine work so they may not have as much um, waste being produced so it's about knowing where the gaps are and and how we can use them most effectively. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, treatment and disposal there so how the waste that's coming from the ambulance how is that consigned? So that is consigned as an 180103 which mm -hmm. is um, infectious waste at the moment it is infectious waste for incineration only so okay. in terms of um, waste from a coronavirus patient that at the moment in the UK is classified as uh, 180103 again but it's a category B so it's infectious waste that's suitable for alternative treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so if anything we're over classifying um, and taking it one step further than we need to. Um, that's not in, in these circumstances that's not a bad thing um, because there is limited space and you know hands all over the place on the back of the vehicle so um, if anything, it's risk averse, uh, which which works in our favour to an extent. Uh, so in terms of capacity, we will have some NHS trusts who are using yellow bags, so the healthcare waste for incineration only, mm -hmm. um, and not segregating for alternative treatment. And whilst that's not best practice, um, it does offer an additional level of reassurance that that waste will be destroyed um, mm -hmm. suitably. So back to capacity, um, things are tight. So mm -hmm. in the UK over the last 18 months, there has been a bit of a roller coaster with the healthcare waste industry. Yeah. Um, and we lost quite a bit of treatment and incineration capacity. However, it's not to a point where it's, it's incredibly desperate yet there are facilities across the UK that are high temperature incinerators but are not dedicated to healthcare waste mm -hmm. so um, on their permits you know these other incinerators are permitted to accept clinical waste um, 180103 mm -hmm. um, so we may see a move to shifting some of the waste onto those so they would typically handle things like um, waste from abattoirs or um, chemical waste, that kind of thing. So there may be a move to shift waste to those um, because they will still have capacity at the moment, particularly with, with the economy slowing down, you know, and a lot of businesses not operating, there will be a lot less waste going to them. Um, so logically, I would think we will probably make use of more capacity in the UK and we are still exporting some as well, but how long we can do that yeah. for um, remains to be seen because obviously Europe have the same issue that we do um, in that they are yeah. seeing rising volumes of healthcare waste. So eventually we may see a stop to export and it means that we will have to rely on the treatment and incineration capacity that we have in the UK. And it could well come to a point where we stop classifying it for alternative treatment and it all just goes to incineration. Um, and I think that's the route that China took. Uh, with their healthcare waste. So um, yeah. it all depends on what is available um, and what we can do with what's available. Mm -hmm. I would like to think that we wouldn't downgrade it any further because that would be quite risky, I think. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But I, I certainly think there wouldn't be any, any issues with upgrading it if it meant that we could dispose of, we, we could process this waste quicker. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to bring Jano in on, on this one because um, I know he's a treatment and disposal expert as well and has a good understanding of um, capacity across the UK and in Europe as well. What sort of pressures are you seeing at the moment? Um, pressures as in um, on, on general waste disposal were, were okay and, and if anything especially in the London area there's an excess of capacity available for the market at present um, mainly due to waste from commercial and industrial sources drying up um, so there's a lot less going to treatment facilities um, so there is in, in, in the London area there's capacity available and, and you know that, that will be the same for facilities elsewhere in the UK that you know, get get a substantial part of their input from commercial sources, and you can see it in the food 
processing sector, for example, the AD, the AD industry, there's a lot less waste coming out of hospitality as well as um, uh, out of date products from uh, food businesses, etc. So they they have got additional capacity available to treat waste from from the mar from you know local authority sources. So. Um, it, it's a it, it's a sort of changing picture as well, and uh, you know I, I know that in some parts of the UK uh, authorities are faced with, you know, increasing domestic household waste tonnages, um, but there's plenty of capacity available at the moment in the market to take this in. You know th that situation is very fluid, and for example, if if energy from waste facilities are starting to be affected by you know critical staff no longer being available then yeah it, it can have a severe impact but the same accounts for landfill you know you can't just sort of you know open the gate and that's it you need to process that waste once it comes in and when the BOMAC drivers are no longer there then how are you going to treat waste at landfills and then it's getting the stuff to the landfill in the first place most landfills are not located near you know, urban areas, so it will require haulage, it will require transfer, and, and that's some, you know, where, where the weaknesses can lay. Um, on the recycling front, as I said, you know, some MRFs are, uh, the situation might become precarious at some point when they don't get the staff in, and when the MRF can't produce the quality, the output quality anymore, then, it, you know, it might have to shut down operations. Um, the same applies for, you know, the, the, the MBT facilities that we've got in the UK, and I know some facilities have, op have changed their operating processes to just provide Provide some basic drying of the waste and then move it on to to other um, other outlets. Um, it's all dependent on, on staff and, and and waste volumes coming in. And you can, for example, you know, if if local authorities are going towards a clear all policy in order to keep streets clear of waste, the waste composition is going to change. That's going to go into that those facilities. So that might impact on throughput as well. In the best case, you know, it might improve it. But if there's a lot of high, you know, calorific Mid, uh, contents in that waste then mm -hmm. the throughput of the facilities will be affected yeah okay we've had um so we've had another question in from Dimitra that says uh can you please write down the classification of waste of a COVID-19 patient and what process it is following in brief as in incineration so I think Karen you you've picked up that from the healthcare perspective Yano, th there's been governments issued um, some guidance about um, treating waste from households where the resident um, has contracted COVID-19. Um, yeah. That comes around a specific uh, wait period, doesn't it, in terms of storing the waste before it's then presented? Yeah, 72 hours. And, and that sort of applies to anything that's been in contact with potentially infectious liquids like tissues, mm -hmm. gloves, mouth masks, all, all that sort of material. Mm -hmm. where, where someone is drunk from a water bottle, it's not classed as um, uh, clinical waste. But I am aware that that advice sort of varies across the, the EU. Um, so when you look at, I had contact with the city of Milan, um, they say if you are um, infected or potentially infected and you're at home, then throw everything as residual. Um, yeah. That sort of, you know, that sort of advice hasn't been given from the UK perspective. Uh, it's still being worked on, but for the moment, you know, if, if you're at home and you've got COVID, if you drank from a bottle, yes, it can go into your mixed recycling. Um, mm -hmm. However, anything that's been in contact with infectious, you know, bodily fluids, etc., that needs to be stored 24 hours, uh, 72 hours, double mm -hmm. bagged. In Milan, they actually go that far to say triple bag. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, double or triple bagged. Leave it at home for in in a secure area for 72 hours, and then it can be disposed of as as regular household waste. Mm. So I know there's been some, um, so there is research ongoing at the moment and they've looked at some worst case scenarios for different materials and they've found that the virus was still present on card after 24 hours and metal and plastics after 72 hours, which I think is where the, the 72 hour figure has come in. But they, uh, the government has specified that these are sort of worst case lab conditions. So actually, they are, you know, they're, they're being very um, cautious in their in their approach here. But it does, um, Karen. I know you you've kind of talked about some of the, I suppose, inconsistencies. I think about what's 
being presented um, at the moment and that we do need to present a consistent message and one that you know everybody understands yeah absolutely so there's been um i think a little bit of confusion and a lot of panic uh, mm -hmm. because when people think of infectious and they know you know we now know just how infectious uh the coronavirus is uh people are quite panicked about getting it and i think we need to kind of take a step back and think a little bit more logically about this so the whole social distancing um and uh, self-isolation and quarantine, it's not about stopping us from getting the virus, it's about slowing down the spread so that we are able to manage it from a healthcare perspective. Uh, realistically speaking, a lot of us may have already had it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, if we haven't already had it, there is a chance that we are going to get it. Um, and I think because we are seeing the really high profile cases and the people who are getting really sick who maybe had no underlying health conditions it's creating quite a bit of panic and um i think some certainly private waste contractors are quite nervous about accepting this type of waste um but you know the research does show after 72 hours it is pro it is most likely that the virus is not viable anymore mm. um so you know as a worst case scenario instead of throwing everything in the residual bin why don't we just hold everything for 72 hours and then segregate as normal because then you are not asking people who are actually quite scared to change another behavior after having to suddenly learn how to homeschool and to work from home and mm -hmm. you know juggle a million other things that are going on actually just keep the normality there um, because what happens when this all blows over is you're going to have to go back and change the new habit that you've just created and I think that will have longer um, implications on the industry as a whole mm. um, because it's, it's taken quite a while for us to get to where we are now in terms of segregation and it was not perfect. So I think it's quite disruptive to, to take a panicked view or a too, too risk averse view on this, um, particularly when the science mm. is telling us that actually it may not be, it's, it's likely to not be a problem after the 72 hour period. Okay, so I suppose it's balancing that with the ability to actually collect the waste and treat yes. it further down the line. So there's lots of interdependencies here really, aren't there? Absolutely, but I think as well you need to not just focus on, on the immediate issue, which is quite difficult, mm -hmm. um, but you also need to think long term as well. So it may be that you do need to collect all your waste in residual eventually. But if we are doing that, why are we telling, you know, why don't we just tell people to continue to segregate it and maintain the good behaviors? Um, because we are going to experience problems further down the line if we try to change the behavior back to quite an old school way of dealing with waste. Um, and, and I think that also instills a bit more panic in the householder as well. Um, so absolutely if it needs to be collected together then then we do so and if it needs to be stored for 72 hours then we do so but it's important also to remember that this will end at some point and life will need to continue and we will need to get on with things um and you don't want to make that harder for yourself than it needs to be um but yes i think panic is is creating quite a big problem um, across the industry. Mm. Jano, did you want to come back on that? Because um, the, the, the thing is, what you shouldn't forget is that, you know, waste can be a source of, of contamination um, uh, anyway. So, you know, the, the, there is there are various viruses and bacteria that might be present on that waste, in, you know, in a, in a normal situation. Uh, everything from salmonella to E. coli, et cetera. And, you know, that's a risk that you need to manage normally anyway. So, you know, the, the COVID situation, yes, there, there will be, you know, potentially, you know, the different materials that might have it on it, but, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a situation we face on a daily basis. And it's, you know, making sure that, 
you know, you, you reduce your contact with the waste if you're collecting it. Um, and, and, you know, good hygiene, making sure that your vehicles are clean, um, that your staff have got the PPE, etc. And, you know, in reality, even if, you know, if, if I drank from a, if I'm a, a COVID infected patient and I drank from a bottle, by the time it gets to the MRF, the, 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 the levels are negligible. And, you know, a, a MRF mm -hmm. staff, for example, they have PPE and they need to have good hygiene anyway. Um, so uh, unless someone does something really silly, they won't, they won't get, you know, the risk of getting infected is marginal. You know, there's all sorts of stuff ending up in waste that shouldn't go in there, syringes mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of other, you know, items that are potentially contaminated. So yeah, as Karen said, let's not panic and, and think about this rationally and, and what's going to happen. And if you're really unsure, then just throw it away as residual. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That brings us nicely on to our next question, really. Um, we've got a question from Moritz Gold, which is, how much will treatment facilities be affected by changing waste composition? Now, what I wanted to go back to, actually, was the massive shifts in behaviour and just the societal change that we have felt over the last few weeks in terms of the lockdown. So we've already talked about the fact that um, some businesses aren't producing waste because their businesses have shut down. Um, nearly everybody is home working. Um, we're dealing with families at home. We are buying a lot of shopping because we're having to eat all of our meals at home. There's no going out to restaurants anymore. What I wanted to ask was what sorts of, in your own personal life, I suppose, what sorts of day-to-day um, -day changes have you felt? And then, Jarno, for you, what, what have you seen in terms of uh, the local authority response and what, um, what challenges are your collection crew seeing on the ground in terms of composition? What's changing? So first of all, I'm going to go to Karen. Um, what's changed in your house really in terms of behaviour? And um, how many toilet rolls do you have at home? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, so we're a family of four. Mm -hmm. um, we have a 16 year old boy so he eats a lot um but actually not a lot has changed for us so um in terms of uh food shopping uh, i'm buying the same things that i was before uh the only thing that i've probably had to change is that i'm buying a lot more vegetables and tinned food as well like um mm -hmm. tinned beans and lentils and, and chickpeas and, and things like that um, but that is only because instead of taking a packed lunch to school, they are having a home cooked meal. So they're not mm. eating, um, well, it's different between my two kids. So my older son, he's not eating sandwiches every day. Um, and my daughter, she used to take salad to school anyway. Um, so she, um, she's not eating salad every day, but they're eating a hot meal at lunchtime instead. So that means that we have had to purchase a little bit more um, in terms of uh, dried foods and tinned foods, but but it's not been excessive. I don't have anywhere to store it. You know, I don't have mm. a huge kitchen. Um, in terms of toilet rolls, it's always a 24 pack. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a 24 pack about every three weeks. And uh, the only thing that's changed, we bought a 24 pack uh, probably two and a half weeks ago, and we've still got some of those left. So not a lot has changed there which which surprises me actually because we are all home all the time um and biscuits we've become quite reliant on biscuits and we went about a whole week without them and it was a very stressful time for us which is um which is a bit <laughs> of a surreal thing really but um yeah i mean we've, we've probably become a little bit more reliant on tinned and dried foods rather than fresh um mm -hmm. but in terms of, of purchasing behavior it's not really changed um yeah. because we didn't eat out a lot before um we all made meals to take to work with us um but you know i have seen and i'm sure you've seen them as well the images on twitter um this morning uh of people throwing away tin food food that's probably got an expiration date of another two or three years on it if not yeah. longer um, and you know there are there are bins out there that are full of this because people have again panicked and they've thought that that food would not be available. But um, in terms of at home, 
not a lot has changed. Um, we are producing a bit more waste than we would have before. Um, but again, I think that's just because we are all here. Um, and particularly, you know, with having to homeschool, that means the paints are out, the paper is out, the, mm -hmm. the crafting materials are all over the place. Um, so, you know, there is a bit more waste than we would usually produce. But again, as a family of four, our residual collection every two weeks mm -hmm. is more than enough. We could probably hold it for four weeks because we are quite lean in the way that we manage our household. Right. Um, and yeah, we've tried not to panic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what about you, Yana? Um, to be honest, I haven't really noticed much of a change. Um, I just bought, brought my rubbish and recycling down the other day and it's still two bags a week, one waste, one recycling. Um, I might throw out a little bit more food waste perhaps because I'm more cooking at home. But then again, I, I'm, I'm getting less deliveries in um, of stuff I've bought online um, and, you know, less stuff I might have bought in a shop somewhere. Um, so in, in, in that respect, I can't really, you know, it's not like that I notice that, oh my God, I have to go to the bin every other day because I've got so much waste. I can't really know, I, I can't really notice it. I haven't really panic bought, oh yeah, I've got a full fridge and a full freezer and the pantry is full, but that's, a, that's about it. I haven't really, you know, gone overboard and, and, and bought like, you know, a pallet full of baked beans or, or, or something stupid. Um, <laughs> So in, in, in that respect, it's pretty much sort of business as usual. Um, my local shop has got, you know, fresh vegetable supplies, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I, I can't really, I, I haven't really, you know, got the fear that I'm running out of certain stuff. Um, <laughs> if I do need something, I know where to get it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, pretty, pretty much normal, I suppose. I, I haven't mm. noticed anything. I think, um, so Karen, you mentioned kind of photos on Twitter. I, I think, I think I've seen a number of different behaviours that have been driven by both a, a fear about a lack of food. So there has been lots of photographs of uh, unopened food packaging that's been thrown out. I know some of that has been linked to international students that had to leave very quickly, but there are other people like the tins. I mean, why would you throw away a tin? Um, so food wastage has been an issue that's been commented on, but, but also actually I've seen quite a few pe uh, people sharing pictures of fly tipping. Um, and I wonder whether given that people are at home at the moment, they're having a clear out, they're sorting out the share, they're doing some DIY, combined with the issues about you know HWRCs being shut and, and frankly it not being an essential journey to travel and dispose of that material um, whether that sort of uh, prompting some um, some bad behavior uh, to be honest is that anything that um, that you've seen so I've seen um, or I suppose I've heard on the grapevine of some uh, occasions of fly tipping locally um, mm -hmm. and it's something that I did raise I don't, I don't know what day it is now um, it was a little while ago but um, mm -hmm. yeah it's something that I did raise you know we've got a situation where HWRCs are closing um, where perhaps your typical waste services are not running so Preston City Council for example they have ceased their skip hire service and their bulky waste collection so mm -hmm. if you decide that you want to buy a new fridge freezer you've got to be able to store the the old one somewhere mm -hmm. um, until until the HWRC is open again or the bulky waste collection services is um, is operational again so um, Locally, there have been some incidences of fly tipping, and I suppose the other concern about this is, is it an opportunity for, for your man in van type who would usually do house removal, suddenly offering waste services, who's perhaps not licensed and doesn't have anywhere to take it to? Um, actually, uh, speaking about that, we've just had our annual leaflet through from... Um, from Preston City Council and on there, I'm really, mm -hmm. really pleased to see warnings about um, rogue traders in the waste industry and, and duty of care and what the implications of 
not doing duty of care are. So the fact that householders can be fined if their waste is found flighted, even if they've paid somebody to take that away. Um, and I think that potentially is going to get worse. It really depends on, I suppose, our, our level of communications around this. Um, the focus at the moment seems to be on what to do if you're self-isolating with the waste that is contaminated. But actually, I think we need to probably continue with our other messaging as well mm -hmm. so it's it's although we do need to focus on that and it's really important that, se that that waste is segregated i think we actually really need to also be reminding people of their responsibilities to their to the management of their waste to the disposal of their waste um, and and their responsibilities for segregating their recycling correctly um, I don't think those messages should go away and I think they have been diluted a little bit because local authorities, certainly the ones who tweet a lot, um, are very heavily focused on what to do if you are self-isolating with your contaminated COVID-19 waste. Um, and there is a concern that other messages will get diluted and you know it's, it's probably very easy with everybody social distancing as well to just nip out and dump it down a lane somewhere because there is nobody mm. around. There's nobody to catch you, to stop you, unless you're unfortunate enough to um, run into the police. And I would say they are patrolling uh, the mm. area here and they are issuing fines for people who do not have a genuine reason for being out um, or are not making an essential journey. So um, yeah, messaging is really important. Um, we shouldn't stop talking about the business as usual because then the business as usual gets diluted and and behaviors slip so good behaviors will slip um and yeah. people may then also think it's okay for them just to nip out and dump some waste but you've also got to think to come back to um the resourcing issue you know local authorities are going to have staff that are sick so they may not be able to go and clear these fly tips as quickly as they would would have been previously um and i'm sure you're probably aware as much as i am that dirt attracts dirt so once somebody has fly tipped once it suddenly becomes a dumping ground for mm -hmm. people who are passing through the community for the local community um mm -hmm. and there's a risk of it really getting out of control if we don't continue the messaging mm -hmm. thank you um, have you seen any examples of good behaviour during this time? Um, I suppose one example of good behaviour is that uh, hospital A&Es are not being as abused as they were previously. Mm -hmm. So A&E yeah. um, attendance is down um, if you, I suppose, if you really want to go to your local hospital um, you will know, or, or if you have to go to your local hospital, you will notice that actually A and E is is unusually quiet, um, mm -hmm. and that then raises the question of why are so many people there in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, other good behaviours, I think there's there's certainly certainly where I live, there's a lot more um interaction with neighbors from a safe distance of course mm -hmm. um you know we earlier last week we were sat on our driveway um doing an art project for my daughter's schoolwork and you know my neighbor came out and she sat on her driveway and we had a conversation for about 25 minutes about nothing really um and it was quite nice um and i think it is bringing people together so we also use the next door app um, and, every, and, and the majority of people in our neighbourhood use them and there's lots of things on there, people offering to do medicine runs and food runs mm -hmm. for the vulnerable people in our local neighbourhood um, to a bear hunt being set up. So residents have been encouraged to place a teddy bear in their windows so that when you go for your daily exercise with your children, they can spot the mm -hmm. teddy bears. And it's just a way of keeping them, I suppose. A little bit distracted when doing something that to children is quite mundane so going for a walk is not always that exciting um, so there's been a few things like that that have been set up um, 
some res oh, the, my favourite one actually was um, one resident uh, took some frog spawn from her pond and gave it to another. So she left it out on her doorstep for him to collect um, so that his children could watch them turn into tadpoles and then frogs later. So there's a lot of um, creativity being born out of being, um, being trapped in our homes, I suppose. And I think that's a good thing. And, and a lot of people want to get to know the people who live around them as well. Um, because I suppose at the moment, everybody's thinking this is only going to get worse. We don't know how long we are going to be, um, be required to stay at home. We don't know if stricter measures are going to come into force in the UK where we may not even be allowed to go out for exercise like in other countries. Um, so I think people are engaging a lot more and wildlife, mm. there's, there's a lot more wildlife about as well, or maybe we just notice it more because there's a lot less cars. That does bring me on nicely actually to um, one of the last questions I've got, which is actually about the future. I mean, we've seen absolutely transformational change due to this crisis. Climate change um, is another crisis that is ever present. Um, do you think that actually going through these challenges with COVID-19 will lead to a change in our thinking about how we address climate change? Yeah, no, I'll go to you first on this. Um, I think it's a very, a very interesting time because I think a, a lot of people and organizations might be reassessing how they work. Um, yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, I think perhaps a lot of organizations have been very conservative and, and, and not really embracing change by saying, oh, no, you can't work from home or we don't support mobile working. And, you know, I think a lot of people are now proving that you can actually work perfectly well from home. Uh, mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that you're running the laundry all day, we're actually focusing on, on, on your job. And I think that for some organizations might be sort of an in, you know, a, a motivation to remodel their operations. And, and why would you keep hold of a, you know, head office somewhere with thousands of people working there or even a you know a regular office um, that costs a lot of money uh, when some people can work from home and you know you, you're seeing now for example that like you know call centers they were always thought of as oh no they have you know you have to travel into this office and work there but a lot of call centers are now working you know from home they've just diverted the lines and it is possible and you know as technology advances and i think we've done quite well that you know we've completely switched pretty much overnight from going to an office and doing something to doing it at home and connecting remotely and you know using technology and i think that's you know it, that will change how organizations are working and it, it's sad to say but I, th I think a lot of businesses might sadly no longer be with us because mm -hmm. they haven't survived the aftermath of this because it's not just you know we it's not just you, you you press pause and 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 then you press play again when this all lot is over there's going to be huge consequences um for businesses and you know, people that are not getting paid and, you know, the, the not getting paid means I'm not going to spend money on certain things. So, it, it, you know, there's tough times ahead. And first, we need to survive this. We need to make sure that, you know, we get through this, um, um, uh, you know, as humanity and that we survive this virus. And then we have to deal with the aftermath. And it might mean that some businesses are going to make very drastic decisions to change certain operational um, processes. Um, and what the world's going to look like, I, I have no idea, but it's definitely a catalyst for change. And with that, our impact on the environment. And, you know, do you need to jump on a plane all the time and meet your clients in you know, other European cities? Or are we going to do yeah. more remotely and, you know, refine how we do that um, rather than, you know, the old fashioned thing of buying a plane ticket and jumping on a plane and going somewhere for a couple of hours and then flying back. So, yeah, there will definitely be, be, be a change in that respect. And, you know, it might also mean that you know we're consuming less mm. need things like single-use packaging because we're, we're not out and about as much perhaps and we're more at home so how does it all going to work out I, I wish i had a crystal ball and you know i, I could predict it. it it's going to be very varied in, in what the impact of that's going to be and hopefully we will use this opportunity as a catalyst for change on the environmental side as well and cut down on some of our you know more wasteful type of behavior 
Yeah, I do like your description of um, hitting pause and then play again. It does feel like we, we need a system reboot afterwards. And the, the IPCC actually warns that global warming will likely accelerate the emergence of new viruses. So yeah. obviously we're dealing with COVID-19 at the moment, but that's not to say that there won't be future pandemics coming down the line. So we do really need to think about whole scale system change and how we can you know, transition to a more circular economy, rethink our consumption, all the good things that you said there, Jarno. Karen, any, anything to but add on that? Oh, sorry, Jarno. Sorry, but it's, it's also where we live and how we live. And because we are living so much closer now to, you know, animals and, and, and ecosystems that we perhaps weren't as close to in the past, and that might see an increased transmission of diseases from animals onto humans. And, you know, COVID sort of comes from the animal kingdom in, in effect. Um, so are we going to see more of those transitions? And there's so many diseases that we're not even aware of. And does that mean that, you know, because there's so many of us now on the planet and we are encroaching more and more onto natural, natural habitats of other animals and other organisms, does that mean that, you know, ultimately we're going to make ourselves a lot more vulnerable so where do we where do we house people where do they live and and how can we you know make sure that nature still has the space it needs without encroaching on it and then with an end result of getting infectious diseases jumping jumping yeah. species mm -hmm. absolutely so before coming back to you karen we've got a couple of other questions that have come in that i want to make sure that we answer uh, the first one is from uh, Stefan Bloom. Is there anything like rescue uh, umbrella stroke extra financial support um, for the recycling industry? Now, not that I know of. I mean, obviously, the, the UK government has provided a huge raft of measures to support businesses. So if um, if you are a recycling uh, company, I'd look at the government website as a first stop and see what sort of provisions it has. It has provisions for, you know, everything from limited companies to through to the self, uh, self-employed. I don't know whether Jana or Karen, you're aware of anything in terms of financial sports specifically for the recycling industry. Uh, not not at this point in time and it, it, it sort of depends as well because it, it, it's not just you know the, 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 there's so many different elements to the recycling industry and is it you know about supporting self-employed people because the, mm -hmm. the, you know the, the government has taken measures regarding that um, uh, paying wages of people that temporarily can't work uh, zero hour contracts etc so so what exactly did you have in mind with with you know support for the recycling industry um, is the government going to pay for you know not being able to sell your paper to a paper recycler mm. I don't think so but perhaps they can help with things around um, staffing costs or um, a potential tax pause or deferred payments like they have done with other industries and you know i think that the, the recycling industry is no different than any other industry and and the measures that government has taken and the, the things that are available to other businesses are also available to to certain sectors elements of the recycling industry excellent next question from paul morgan um is there likely to be any guidance from defra on waste service provision or is it just wish and this is especially in relation to hwrc opening um and he's sharing some insights that in in some areas there are real political pressure to have sites open despite going uh, to the tip not being on one of the four things that we can do actually so it's not it's not a, an essential activity is it really um now i'm not aware of any of the specific advice coming out i think the wish guidance will be revised ciwm website um if you go on there and they circulated some information at the end of last week they have a list of all of the different guidance that's come out there's some useful um scottish guidance that i was reading which is from uh resource management association scotland um, that I'll happily share the, the link to at the end of this call. Um, but I think in relation to that, I would, it's really difficult, particularly when there's political pressure to keep services open. But I think it's just putting forward that actually it's not, you know, it's not an essential journey that you're asking your residents to, to make. Um, 
Next question, uh, Paul Morgan has put some observations forward. Uh, contingency plans weren't wide ranging enough. Um, didn't necessarily consider getting drivers, etc., from highways, uh, offers of staff and vehicles from private sector as a means of keeping their resources utilised. Well, absolutely. I, I would say that actually contingency plans, probably in the public sector, with the exception of the NHS, um, might have picked up on the flu pandemic, but I've not seen any that really comprehensively covered this sort of scenario. Um, good idea in terms of getting drivers from highways, and I think Jana mentioned early on that you know the um, services are drawing in resources from from everywhere, from parks and um, parks and gardens, grounds maintenance, street cleansing, etc. So I think we'll see a lot more partnership working coming up between local authorities, but also between private sector providers and authorities as well. Um, Stefan Bloom has got a question. Oh, Jana, did you want to come back on that one actually? Yeah. Sorry. Um, the, the thing is, it's like I've been part of a, a couple of sort of, you know, pan London, pan UK conversations on this. And the agency, the employment agencies have got a huge amount of drivers and loaders on their books at the moment um, because a lot of drivers have been laid off temporarily mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or permanently as, as operations change. So, you know, if, if you are a local authority and you're facing a staff shortage, please ring the agencies first by, you know, you know, and avoid panicking because there is resource out there. Mm -hmm. That's a really good tip, actually, because I, I did wonder how um, how authorities were getting on with driver shortages. I, I know there has been um, driver shortages, particularly across London for a little while, but it's good advice to, to ring the agencies, I think, as a first point of call. Um, Next question, Stefan Bloom. Um, it was asked generally, uh, but guess the most vulnerable is the informal sector. Okay, so that's a good point. Within within the UK, definitely the the informal sector in terms of um, waste and recycling, particularly those charities that are looking at things like reuse, um, are struggling, um, as are many businesses in that line. I think. There are a lot of organisations, charity uh, organisations that have stepped up and are thinking about ways that they can support. So I'm seeing a lot of organisations such as Olio, for example, doing more um, surplus food redistribution. Um, so they're focusing on the needs of the community at the moment. But I think, yes, that they the informal sector will see a challenge. If we're talking about the informal sector worldwide, uh, Waste Aid has published some really good guidance for um, waste collectors on their website, and that'll be one of the links that we we pass out after the webinar as well. Any uh, Karen, you know anything on informal sector that you wanted to put uh, add to? Okay, uh, unless. Um, last comment that's come in from Paul Morgan, um, who says uh, communications post virus will need to be more comprehensive than they've ever been. I think this is a really interesting point because actually, um, just in, I suppose, in the recycling sector, when local authorities' budgets started to crash, actually, it was the communications budgets that were one of the first lines that were crossed off. Um, we're having to communicate really functional information to our residents at the moment, so very specific instructions about what to do. But when we do come out of this, um, there will need to be renewed communications to them about, about waste prevention, reuse, recycling, what they can do to consume less effectively. So this sort of transition again to a more circular economy. Any thoughts on that in terms of communications, uh, yeah. Yana? I, I think what we shouldn't forget is that we've got a huge piece of work on our hands anyway, what the resources and waste strategy is bringing, and that will yeah. include mm -hmm. huge amounts of communications, new burdens, new ways of funding, new ways of doing things. So, you know, perhaps a lot of things can be wrapped up as part of the overall changes that are coming our way anyway. Mm. Um, 
So yes, absolutely, communication is important, but um, I, I think we need to play this very carefully that we're not going to send out loads of mixed messages um, and then making changes and, and in the end, no one understanding what, what they're meant to be doing. So, you know, huge changes heading our way anyway. It's, you know, it, it, it's starting already. We've only got like, you know, three years before the first things on the resources and waste strategy coming mm -hmm. in are coming in huge amounts of stuff has to change in the meantime. So, you know, have, have an, a good overall view when this whole COVID situation is over as to what we need to start communicating. Yeah, good point. Karen, do you want to come in on that at all? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think it's, it's communication is key really, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And not just from local authorities. So within organizations as well. So shortly before, um, Shortly before the world went a little bit crazy with coronavirus, uh, NHS England and NHS Improvement started a new green uh, for a greener NHS campaign, which is all around, um, I suppose, creating a more sustainable healthcare system to mm -hmm. to try and combat climate change because the organisation itself, the NHS, is is huge, um, and we have a. a a significant impact really um, and it was great to see that comms was coming out from a central point rather than just um, people like me who are having to to juggle I suppose quite a lot of different responsibilities and then try and communicate to everybody on top of that so um, I don't know if something like that could be applied to local authorities where there is a standardized messaging Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily a standardised service, because I know not everybody agrees with that, but a standardised messaging um, about what typically can and can't be recycled. And then on a local basis, if they accept other things and they can, you know, um, they can notify residents of that via leaf leafleting or bin stickers or, or whatever they want to do. But I think actually having a standardised message that is coming from a central point is is how we get the communications quite strong um, mm -hmm. because if if you are interested in waste prevention and recycling you're going to be following a lot of people on social media who talk about mm -hmm. this you're going to be paying a lot of attention to uh, documentaries and tv shows um, and i think it's really important that when when we are when we are reading the content that's out there and we're watching things on the tv that the message is joined up and they're not conflicting because then you get people going well i didn't think we could recycle these things but this guy on the tv says it can be recycled but actually they don't understand the complexity um such as you know things like polystyrene which mm -hmm. technically are recyclable but actually there's a lot of complexities behind getting it to be recycled because of the volumes that are required to make it economically viable so definitely when it comes to comms it needs to be quite a strong centralized message of what you need well i suppose where we want to be and how we're going to get there and what householders need to do and what the general public needs to do when they're out and about as well excellent it sounds like a job for recycle now and RAF actually um, rolling out a national campaign uh we've got a couple more questions come in uh one from ranges what are the impacts on treatment and disposal infrastructure? I think we've um, so we've covered some of these points off, haven't we, in terms of actually which types of treatment infrastructure are okay at the moment, what is coming up to capacity. Um, we talked a little bit about MRFs and some of the pressures in terms of end market but also back to back to staffing really and physical distancing and and how staff move around the operations safely. Um, anaerobic digestion actually was one thing that we didn't uh, kick up on. I know there's been a lot of um, surplus food being produced at the moment. We talked about some uh, local authorities actually ceasing their um, food waste collection services. So. There may be a reduction in um, food waste going to those types of facilities. And any other observations, uh, Jana or Karen, on treatment and disposal infrastructure? 
Well, well as I explained earlier, um, there's no crisis in disposal mm -hmm. at, at this point in time, and I'm, I'm not foreseeing it uh, at this point in time. Um, facilities that take in commercial material as well as local authority material, or, or maybe even 100% commercial material, seeing that tonnage mm -hmm. has decreased. A lot of the commercial food waste processors have got spare capacity, there's spare collection capacity available in, the, in, in those markets as well. So it, it, there's not much of an impact. Um, and, you know, for local authorities, it, 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 it means whatever needs to be done to maintain public hygiene is what will be done. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of waste facilities are, are automated to a high extent. So, you know, it, it takes a lot for an energy from waste plant to go down, right, before, you know, for it to be shut off. Um, so I, I can't really see, see that happening at, at, at this point in time. How that's going to develop, I'm not sure. Um, how are plants going to deal with scheduled maintenance? Because we're going into maintenance period now. We we're sort of after mm -hmm. the peak of winter, so facilities are going into maintenance. Does it mean you know I've heard of some facilities that are going to defer their maintenance until later because also contractors are not available to do the works. Some contractors need to come in from abroad. They can't get a hotel. So that, that there's there's a lot of things at play here. But so far the disposal systems are are holding up fine. It's it's the collection systems that are you know even more labor intensive where you know decisions need to be made as to what comes first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think we, I suppose in the UK as well, we have to remember that we're actually not yet at peak. Um, so we're still in, although we're in lockdown as residents, we're still in early days in terms of the number of cases um, and the subsequent waste that we need to deal with. So it's a watching brief really. Excellent. Okay, so I think we have answered all of the questions. So I'm going to ask you for final points as a wrap up. So any sort of final reflections on um, I suppose what you're what we're going to see for the next 12 weeks and any any concerns or, or hopes for the future? Quite wide ranging, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, so I think from um, a healthcare waste perspective, we are um, we are expecting quite a large volume of waste mm -hmm. to be to be produced. But I think really it depends on whether guidance changes. So at the moment, I think the approach that the government have taken is quite logical um, in terms of. Uh, the way householders who are self-isolating handle their COVID-19 waste um, and how uh, the NHS is, is advised to handle their waste um, and also community health care who, um, not all community health care, but some community health care practitioners who would ordinarily use the residence bins um, have been advised to follow the householder rules as well of 72 hours um, uh, hold on the waste. So um, I think really as long as we remain logical with the way the the guidance is going and we don't uh, hit a point where capacity is getting quite stretched and, and we kind of panic a little bit on what we're going to do with it, I think as long as we, we stay logical and we know where there is capacity um, then I, I don't foresee it being a major issue. It may be that there could be a backlog of waste for a, well, I don't know how we define short, but mm. you know there could be a backlog of waste for a few weeks um, as we process through that and we come out the other side of the peak. Um, mm. I suppose it's a challenging time. We've never been through this before um, and it's hard to predict what will and won't happen. Um, I certainly hope that we don't panic um, in terms of COVID-19 waste. Uh, we saw in China that their waste, um, their infectious waste increased fivefold over the mm. period. But the reason for that was not because they were treating so many people. It was because they deemed all waste within a hospital or healthcare environment as infectious. Um, and I think we need to avoid doing that. And we need to try and keep segregation practices as normal as possible to avoid overloading the system, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, remain calm and logical about it, approach mm -hmm. it as 
it is just an increase in volume. We don't need to panic about the waste itself because we have procedures in place to deal with that within the NHS, um, certainly. And uh, I don't know. I, I wish I knew what was coming in the next 12 weeks. It's quite difficult, isn't it? Um, I'd like to think, uh, like Jano said earlier, that it is challenging people who thought that we couldn't be a nation of home workers. Um, and I think that's going to be quite a key thing when we come to the other end of this, because um, working in sustainability, obviously, I try to promote home working as much as I can because it leads to reductions in traffic and reductions in air pollution mm -hmm. um, and reductions in cost and business miles and and quite a lot of other benefits come with it, too. Um, so I would like to think when we come out of the other end of this, that organisations are more accepting of a different way of working. And it may not be that, that we all suddenly become home workers and we're here every day. But actually, if you could get people to work from home one or two days a week, you would, you would see like the school holiday effect, um, mm. where there would be less cars on the road, less pollution, um, less people getting stressed on their way to work, um, because it's the last thing you want. You don't want to be stressed when you arrive because it just sets you wrong for the whole day. Um, so I think there are positives to be had and to be seen and opportunities to to be taken. Um, and I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think really we do need to be we do need to be logical about this. And I know it's really hard to do so when so many people around you are panic buying food and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think there are opportunities on the other end to certainly make some big lifestyle changes across the whole nation. Mm -hmm. That's good, systemic change. Jano, any final thoughts? Uh, I think I think for local authorities, it's, it's sort of, you know, it, make sure your business continuity plans are in order uh, and, and do test exercises every now and again. And I actually vividly remember a number of years ago doing a, a contingency exercise, like a, a pan love and contingency exercise with the emergency services, with local authorities, et cetera, on a scenario like this. And it's worth making sure that, you know, the waste sections are appropriately represented in the contingency plans. And if you need help with it, then ask someone for help rather than, you know, put a plan in place that might not work. That's good advice. Thank you very much. Just before I uh, hand over to um, uh, Swetha, I just want to say thank you. I know it's, you've taken time out of your busy day to do this, and I think there's been some really useful um, snippets of information that you've shared there. And I think that's really my uh, my point to finish on here. This is a time to share knowledge, to share information, to share experience. So I'd encourage everybody to reach out if you're having issues, share how you're feeling, but get those sort of top operational tips, um, information about where you can take your material to, how your crews are doing, etc. And and don't be shy. Everybody's here to help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I mean, I, I really thought the summary of uh, how you summarized it was actually great. So yes, that I think we should all leave with that message to share as much as you can. And uh, if you need to reach out to any of the panelists, you can write to us at connect at wastewise.be and we'll ensure that your questions are sent to them or we will connect you directly with the panelists themselves. Um, and like I did mention in the beginning of the panel, this is, not the, uh, this is not the only panel about the crisis. We specifically talked about UK today. We are putting together panels for other parts of the world as well. So keep following our website and you will get updates and do sign up to our newsletter as well. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thanks a lot for taking time out because this is a very busy time, both uh, work-wise as well as personally. So thanks a lot for this time. And yes, bye-bye. I hope you all stay safe and have a good day. Mm. Thank you.